Okay. Uh, it is bills. Okay, guys, how are you doing today? How are you, sir? Who wants to share some good news from the weekend? I will, I will. All right, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I finally got my first contract for seller, and it just shows that perseverance uh, pays off. I have been um, giving this seller love for about eight, 10 months now, handwritten cards, all kinds of stuff. And so finally, the contract signed on Saturday. So he um, just shows, per, like I say, perseverance pays off. And uh, Greta, got to gotta be like the honey badger, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what's the biggest lesson you learned in a, a 10-month courtship with, with this particular client? Uh, patience, and uh, that's not what my strong point on that. Uh, my my every day is God give me patience and give it to me right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it just shows that you, um, uh, you know, first of all, if you just keep on doing the right thing every single day, sooner or later, um, that that person will become your client. That's right, and and at the very least, at the very least you are gonna get experience in having uh, a variety of conversations and kind of getting more um, acclimated to how things, you're gonna get more evidence that people's lives change all the time. And it will convince you that you, your job is to be there when they need you to be there, right? And if you do the right thing, you will get the business eventually, or at the very least, you're gonna learn a lot and probably get some referrals along the way, right? Um, all right. Who else? Well, I, uh, good morning, everyone. I got a buyer under contract. It'll be the A sign. Boy, a listing and then a buyer. Boy, good job. Same month, so <laughs> thanks. Good and job. I got them through, through um, Kathy. Excellent, excellent. And where did this buyer come from? Another referral. Like you always say, the, the seeds of some, what is it? Something about some seeds. You got to plant the seeds and you got to let them grow. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so they're, they're sprouting. <laughs> like we, we, uh, we, we cut away a little corner of uh, some, some um, little bed in our backyard yesterday and um, we worked the land, right? We, we, we flattened it, we cleaned it up. We planted some seeds. We planted some fertilizer. You know, we did all the right things. And I'm going to go out there today. I'm going to be like, where my, where my, where's my cilantro, right? And it ain't going to be there. And I got to have faith that it's in there doing its job. And I'll see it eventually, right? However, if I was counting on that cilantro to eat today, it ain't going to happen. So I got to go plant a lot of seeds all over the place, right? so that enough of it blooms in the right time so that I can get what I need when I need it. Make sense? Hey, Pam, tell us a little bit about, about your weekend with this kind of double open house thing. I want, I want everyone to hear what you did. Okay, well, first of all, I have a buyer that went under contract. We have a binding agreement on a home that they're purchasing this week. We got that done this weekend. Nice. All right. And um, I had a, a listing um, go active on, uh, Friday morning, and the family has a small child and a dog. So, and the and the wife is there with her mother handling everything because the husband's already moved on to his new job out of state. So, I suggested to them that we do uh, open houses on for, uh, on Saturday and Sunday. We did one to five because we thought let's get as many people in there as possible. And we had uh, 21 people come through, or family groups come through uh, Saturday and 13 yesterday. Um, we currently have two offers. Um, the one is um, for like 15,000 over list. And the other is, they have an escalation clause in it with no upper limit, uh, which and the, and the contract was, I'll say, poorly written in several ways. Um, 
but the first one very, you know, very well written contract as well. Um, I, I've been told by several others that we're going to get offers. We just don't have them yet. So, well, now we have an opportunity to go back to um, all the all the people that have submitted offers and seen the property and uh, say, hey, we got multiple offers, right? Your deadline is Tuesday morning. Well, and and I set up the expectation that we expected several uh, multiple offers, you know, in the uh, private remarks on the listing. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple of things, you know, like I'm going to, uh, I expect to, you know, of course, after discussing it with the sellers, but I expect to counter back with asking for an appraisal gap uh, on on the list, on the price that they're willing to offer. And, you okay, know, what, those of you who don't know that. I was mean, about to say, what's an appraisal gap, Pam? Yeah, that, for, that means that if they've offered you know, over our asking price, they that they are will over our list price that they are willing to pay any gap between what the home appraises for and what they've offered. Um, that they will pay that in cash, so that my client doesn't have to you know be concerned about the deal falling through if it didn't appraise. You know, because things are moving so fast and appraisals are a picture of the past. And, exactly. you know, so it may not, it may not fully reflect what's going on in the market right now. Plus you just can't, um, I'll say you can't, there's just, there's never any guarantee on appraisal if it'll appraise, you know, I've had houses, I thought, oh, this won't be a problem. It's going to appraise. It didn't. Yeah. Or, you know, and the, and um, houses I was kind of like crossing my fingers on and it appraised just fine. So that's right. Um, so Pam, where does that go? when you do that appraisal gap, where do you put that in writing? In the special stipulations. I mean, was, in this case, it would be in a counter offer. I was gonna say, is that a counter offer, a special stipulation and a counter yeah, offer? I, okay. I, am, I will counter offer, um, what I want to do is counter offer two things. One is I always uh, say that, uh, you know, any, any due date rather than allowing it to, you know, any due date expiration to be 11.59 p.m. I, I, I like to counter with it being 7 p.m. on the date of expiration, just because, you know, 11 o'clock, I hope I'm asleep. Yeah, nobody <laughs> wants to be up at 11 o'clock at night trying to wait for some email to come through. Right, exactly. And of course, I check this with my buyers and the, you know, with the seller's agent to make sure that works with, you know, their work schedules, because some people have, you know, work schedules that maybe seven wouldn't work, but maybe eight would work or, some, or something like that. I just don't want to be up late going, is this coming through? Is this coming through? You know? Yeah. And so I will counter with that. And I will also uh, counter with the appraisal gap. Perfect. Um, and you guys had like, 30 something people come through the open house, right? Yeah, yeah, 34, wow. I think, you know, of family groups. Wow. So, wow. And by the way, this home, they're going to, we're going to sell this home for probably over a hundred grand more than they paid for this home a, uh, five years ago. And it's also going to be close to $50,000 above the number that we gave them as a range like two months ago on what we thought the home would sell for. Right, because some things sold in between the time we first talked to them and now yep. that enabled us to, you know, go higher with the off, you know, with the list price and feel confident, you know, that it would, that it would appraise. There's one house that's a comp that's closing this week. And I'm really, I know, I, I know it went for at least list price. So I'm anxious to see what it actually sold for. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Okay, let's do uh, one more and then we're going to watch a little video. Um, this is Corey. Good morning, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I have my first closing today, so I'm very yeah, excited thanks. about that. Yay. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to Pam's point, um, the appraisal uh, stipulation was that that combined with the um, the letter that I suggested my buyers write um, is what set us apart from the pack um, and and allowed us to win 
among the you know the multiple offers as, um, as in addition to a cash offer that was above our um, our final uh, agreed upon price. That so awesome. yeah, um, but you know it, it came down to you know this the strength of their the financing. You know they they had uh, the funds to to go through with this. And so we actually had a, we started with a $25,000 um, uh, stipulation so that we would, we would if, if it appraised for $25,000 um, under the agreed upon price that they would agree to bring it up. They would pay that in cash. Um, and the, the sellers countered with, um, you know, a higher, basically 10 above what we had agreed upon and then increasing the appraisal contingency to 35 and they agreed. Um, and um, thankfully it appraised right on the nose of the, on the, um, the price, the selling price. Yeah. That's just, that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, so that, and then um, there was something else that Pam said I was going to, Oh, just the, the, talking point about, and I think Bill, you had said this too, um, that, you know, a couple months before you listed the home, you had given the range and you ended up, you know, listing it or it went up 50,000 above. And so, you know, of, of that, that original suggested range, those are really good talking points for, for meeting with your, your sellers. Uh, as well as buyers, you know, um, that the market can change and it's, it has changed drastically, drastically in the past, um, well, you know, over the past year, but uh, certainly even in the last month. Oh yeah. So, By the way, if you sell your home to open door or one of those kind of places, they're not calling you back and saying, Hey, the market's moved. We're comfortable giving you an extra 40 grand. That ain't happening. Okay. Right. One of the benefits of being with a real live person that has a genuine interest in helping you net the most dollars. Hey, Bill, I didn't realize my phone was on mute. Can I share? Yeah, please. <laughs> All right. So Friday I had a, um, a buyer consultation and I actually was able to have my lender that I worked with on there. And I really left them speechless by the end based off the questions that they had. And they was like, oh, it's almost scary how you pretty much answered everything. Um, and so I'll get a buyer brokerage agreement signed with them today. And I have three appointments set for this week. And I took updated pictures and got some content filmed on Saturday. So that was my weekend. <laughs> wow. Man. Great job. Great job. Great job. Awesome job. Congrats. Well, I do and I wanted to add one other thing I did here that um, I had several people comment you know, that I did on this listing that I had several people comment on, um, as, you know, some agents especially. But, uh, you know, a lot of times we hand out um, disclosures or we have some sitting on the counter or something. I did a trifold display board and put um, on one side of it, I had the seller's property disclosures. I had the list from the um, owners of the things they had done to the home in there since they bought it. And then I also had the community association disclosure. And that was just to me one more way of keeping it safe during these times because nobody had to touch it. I like that. Uh, did you take a picture of that, Pam? Can you I share did, that? I did not. Oh. Um, I don't, Corey, did you happen to take a picture? Corey, help me with the open house. Um, no, I did not. Um, I'll but set it, it up. It was I'll beautiful. I mean, it's, what kind of board? It's a trifold display board. Oh. I got the foam version because it's a little more sturdy. Um, and I got it from Staples. Um, yeah. Or not Staples, Office Depot. Um, like when we used to do our kids, uh, you know, school projects, you know, like with, when they did yeah. something. I, I heard trifold and I'm like, oh, what's a trifold board? <laughs> trifold. I, um, but anyway, I. You know, and I didn't do anything fancy with it. I just, I got a blackboard and I put, you know, the disclosures on it. So, you know, they stood out a little bit and I put disclosures up at the top with stickers. So <laughs> nothing fancy. And, 
And you um, circled the areas that were, you know, of interest because, you know, those forms are, can be difficult for people who are not like us, who are not, you know, who are used to reading them. Um, you know, sometimes it's like so much information. So, you know, you, you did a good job of highlighting or circling the areas uh, that they could, you know, really zone in or zoom in on and that were important to, to know. Yes, you're right, Corey. I did. You know, they had a few issues like a, a pipe had burst and they'd had to replace uh, some uh, the water line into the house and some things like that. So, you know, under, it had explanations on it. And so, yes, I did circle those with a um, Sharpie. Right. Color, by the way, it was, a, it was more thorough than pipe burst. There was water everywhere. We fixed it. Right. 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 Yes. It was well. pipe burst. Insurance company was contacted immediately. All work was done by licensed professionals. All receipts are available. Well, um, it was actually, they were reporting what had happened. They reported what had happened when they got the home that was on their seller's property disclosure, but they also had, um, the water line came into the house and you can see the blue PEX pipe go, they routed it through the garage because the other option was to tear up the slab. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's obvious that something's being routed through the garage. So it highlighted what, what that actually was. Interesting. Um, one thing, I just want to button one thing or tie one thing up before we move on is Pam made, she didn't go into a lot of detail, but she, she referenced two different times that one of those offers was sloppily written. Right. So what, what, it, what was your immediate reaction when you got a real tight offer and a real sloppy offer? Well, just that, that the tighter offer and, and, and the tighter offer is, you know, of course, the better written offer, but I feel like that's someone who's better representing their client. Um, in both cases, in one case, the agent is the girlfriend of the buyer. And in the other case, it's the agent and her husband purchasing the home. So, you know, they're both, um, both very interested in the home, but, um, you know, and, and I just, I, you know, to me, it makes sense professionally to work with the one who writes the better offer, who takes care of business and has been educated, but also, um, you know, even though one might consider the poor written offer a better offer because it agrees to go 2000 above another offer and it had zero due diligence period. Yeah, it's almost like sometimes when you get a poor, poorly written offer, it's like the counter is like 10 things that you shouldn't even have to discuss. It's like, hey, don't forget to check that. That's going to screw over your client if we don't address this now, right? It's like all these clerical mistakes that need to be tended to. It's just more frustrating. Like with two offers, they may get, they, it may get acceptable, but if there's 50 offers and one of them's sloppy. It's like, I'm not even paying attention to you. Like, the whole experience is going to be sloppy if you're starting off with a sloppy offer, right? I say all that to say, um, guys, let somebody look at the offer if possible. Let's just make sure it's, it looks nice and sharp before you submit it, okay? Candace and I are both happy to do that. All right. Um, if you guys didn't notice, we have officially, um, just to keep expectations and results similar, we have decided that these meetings are going to go to a quarter after you need to leave ahead of time. We totally get it. I just want to set um, realistic expectations, okay? Um, let's watch this video real fast. All of you leaving here have the potential for enormous success. There's a price that comes with that. First and foremost, knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. Being able to answer this question, who am I and what do I want? I'm asking the bigger question of who am I? Who am I really? And what do I want? I don't want to just be successful in the world. I don't want to just make a mark, have a legacy. 
answer to that question for me is I want to fulfill the highest, truest expression of myself as a human being. You must have some kind of vision for your life. Even if you don't know the plan, you have to have a direction in which you choose to go. You want to be in the driver's seat of your own life because if you're not, life will drive you. Knowing who you really are in this space and time that we embody. You must find a way to serve. Martin Luther King said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. Now we live in a world where everybody wants to be famous and where we admire people for just being famous. We think being known brings us value. The truth is all of that will fade in time. In three years, you won't be able to name the housewives of Atlanta. The real truth is that service and significance, service and the significance that you bring to your service is that which is lasting. When you shift the paradigm of whatever it is you choose to do to service and you bring significance to that, success will, I promise you, follow you. Service and significance equals success. Here's the key. Learn from every mistake because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes are there to teach you and force you into being more of who you are. And then figure out what is the next right move. What is your true calling? What is your dharma? What is your purpose? All of you leaving here have the potential for enormous success. There's a price that comes with that. People don't always like you. And they're not always happy for you. And if you surround yourself with people who are not accustomed to your success, they become fearful. They become scared. Because you are reflecting back something to them that they don't recognize. People who want the best for you want you to be your best. So my greatest advice to you is to surround yourself with people who are going to fill your cup until your cup runneth over. And what I know for sure is that the biggest choices begin and end with you. Your internal big questions. Who do I want to be in the world? Be excellent. People notice. Let excellence be your brand. Everybody talks about building a brand. I never even knew what that was. When people say, you're a brand, I'd say, no, I'm just Oprah. What I recognize now is that my choice to in every way, in every example, in every experience, to do the right thing and the excellent thing is what has created the brand. All right, give me some ahas. You want me to start? Okay. Um, when we learn from our mistakes, we grow, right? So what does that presuppose? Presuppose that we're action-based, right? We're action-oriented and we're comfortable with making mistakes, right? We have a lot of real estate agents out there, and I suspect there's at least one of them on this call that are reluctant to get out there and have the conversations, right? And I believe for those that have um, been there before and were able to conquer that, 
<clears throat> um, you're starting to see some pretty massive success. So get comfortable being uncomfortable, get comfortable taking action and, and winning sometimes and not winning sometimes. And that way you'll grow and you'll continue to be able to move the move everything forward. Um, okay, who else wants to share a thought about that video? So what I got out of it was coming from a place of service. And if you're always coming from a place of service that you'll be successful in the long run. If you're bringing value and um, just integrity and coming from a place of service. Love that. All right, let's do one more share and then I'm gonna go over some concepts um, about uh, some mindset stuff. Who else wants to share? Well, I just like to say that um, when she talks about let excellence be your brand, I think a lot of times we get caught up in that our brand has to be kind of uh, catchy or clever, but it really is as simple as being excellent at what you do. And that means getting up in the morning and getting dressed because when you make those calls, if someone wants to see you in 30 minutes, you got to be ready to go. And that's part of, part of your habit, your daily habits bring that excellence, I think. Right. I totally agree. That was great. And, and for those, by the way, that have tried working in their pajamas and those that have the same person that has tried to work in like, a, you know, dress, dress to impress, right? Dressed in a suit or work clothes or whatever, you, you feel different, don't you? Doesn't it feel different? Yes, completely. <laughs> Love that. Okay. Anyone else dying to share? Okay, I want to share something with you. It's it's a video that I um, that I did last summer or so, um, and the idea was uh, ten steps to a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, by the way, it's also ten steps to three hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars or whatever. So, um, it, if you want to make more than a hundred, I applaud you. We all know it's possible, and these steps are applicable to you as well. Okay, so. Um, this is a document that I, I kind of uh, had as like a, an, an outline, basically. And I'm going to kind of give you a little overview of it um, again today. Okay. In order for when, when somebody had a, like kind of a, a, a vision or a dream to earn a certain amount of money, let's just say it's $100,000 in this scenario. Um, I've heard a bunch of times that you, when you set a goal, the goal should be large enough where you look at that and you say, I'm not so sure that this person can achieve that goal. So I'm going to have to become a different person in order to achieve that goal. Right. So, for example, if I let's say I wanted to run a marathon before the end of the year. This guy ain't running a marathon. OK, but if I do some stuff to set, you know, to prepare my mind and to prepare my body and to prepare my um, disciplines, then it's very possible that this person with some changes can run a marathon by the end of the year. Y'all follow that? So we need to be a, become a different person oftentimes in order to achieve these goals uh, that we set out to do. So what I suggested is we needed to have a number of different six-figure uh, habits and, and, uh, and um, ideas. Okay. So what, what I said is if you want to make six figures, you got to have a six figure mindset and goals. Okay. So that includes, and is primarily made up of the big why, right? Why are we doing what we're doing? What makes us unique, right? Um, how, how do we intend to serve the public, right? What is our mindset around habits and discipline and focus, right? And do I have goals that I'm, that I'm clear about? Right. I, I speak to a lot of agents and they say, oh, I want to sell 20 units this month or this year. I say, oh, interesting. That's that's an awesome goal. So just out of curiosity, how many um, appointments do you need to set each month in order to pull that off? And more often than not, they say, I'm not really sure. And because I've seen people hundreds of times, I'm thinking to myself, there ain't no way this person is going to make this income. Right. Not because they're not capable of it just because they don't even know the play they're supposed to run, right? So it's very difficult to win when you're not, when everything is kind of happenstance, right? 
So you have to have a six-figure mindset. You have to go in there saying, hey, I'm going to serve more people than I'm used to serving. I'm going to behave differently than I'm used to behaving because I want different results, right? The next thing is a six-figure plan, standards, and habits, right? Some of those are the lead generation habit, right? No matter what, it's like, if you don't shower today, you're going to feel a little weird by the end of the day, right? Is that right? Yeah. If you don't shower tomorrow, you're going to feel real weird, right? Tawantas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot for a second. Every time I try to wake up early, I, I log on to Facebook and Tawantas is like already done with her workout. It don't matter what time I try to wake up, she's already <laughs> been to the gym and back. Okay. If you didn't go to the gym for like two or three days in a row, you would feel so weird, wouldn't you? You would. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we have the same attitude towards the most important task of our business, which is finding opportunities, right? Lead generating. So I want you to feel if you go a whole day without lead generating, you should feel as if you're like having showered. It's like, gosh, itching a little bit, right? Or you haven't worked out if that's a habit or you haven't eaten, right? Like how seriously are you committed to generating business and to keep this train on the, on the tracks, right? Are you committed to being learning based, right? When you have some free time, are you listening to a podcast? Are you reading a book or are you just kind of wasting time? right? And uh, defining your minimum standard. We talked about standards last week, right? What is the minimum standard for your business? Is it making 10 calls a day? Is it talking to 10 people a day? Is it adding somebody to your pipeline? Is it posting on social media? Like what, what are you committed to doing, right? What is the standard and the plan that you're going to execute on so that you're en route to a six-figure life, right? Got to have six-figure time management, Time management is knowing exactly what the priority for the day is. It's having everything earmarked that it is important in your calendar so that there's an appropriate amount of time to do it, right? And we're living by a 411 or something similar to a 411 where you can come into your office and you know exactly what you're supposed to do every day, right? You got a sheet of paper that tells me, hey, this is what I'm supposed to do today. You gotta have a six figure database. Right. If you got 12 people in your database and you intend to sell 20 homes this year, um, I don't care how talented you are, it ain't gonna happen. Right. We gotta have a database that's reflective of the goals that we have. Right. And maybe part of that is to set a minimum standard for how fast that database is gonna grow. Right. So as a full-time realtor or even a part-time realtor, my commitment is to add two people to my database a day. That's how I know I'm working. If I had two people or more, I'm working, life is good, this business is moving forward. If I don't add anyone to my database today, I mean, I, I didn't grow, right? This lost opportunity, right? We need to have a six-figure communication strategy, right? Do, do we use the DTD2? Do we use the 36 Touch program? What does our lead generation system and our lead follow-up system look like? What's our transaction management system look like? We have standards in place to make sure that none of the deadlines get missed or that all of the, you know, contracts are uploaded and compliant and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, Six-figure accountability and reporting. Um, are we tracking our conversions? Are we tracking our, our data? Okay. And what are we doing about with what we find? Which leads me into a, a side comment which is like, there's like, I don't know, four or five people that are have reported their numbers. I gotta tell you, um, it's a little disappointing to be honest with you, right? It's a little disappointing. I don't wanna have to remind you guys about your numbers. The numbers reporting is for you guys, okay? So I know what, you're, what you need help with and it's so you can have a real honest assessment of how you performed. That's simply all it is. But to have four or five people report, it's, it's, that one stings a little bit, okay? So please take a minute and report your numbers, please. Okay. Um, okay, and six-figure accountability, that's what coaching is. So congratulations, you guys are here. You guys are here to learn. You guys are here to make sure that your behaviors are being you know, kind of monitored and improved, 
and that you're willing to be uh, coached because as we know, coaching leads to increased performance. It's that simple, right? Six figure health and morning routine. How are you maintaining your energy, right? Six figure expense management. Do you have a budget? Does your business have a budget? Do you know how much money you're spending? Are you able to do any kind of forecasting with how much money you anticipate making? That's the whole idea of the pipeline, by the way, is if you look at your pipeline and you have, let's say, 25 people on the pipeline, but no one wants to do business with you in the next three months, um, we got a couple of choices. Either we go and find the people who want to do business later in the year and create urgency with them, we go and find some immediate uh, people who want to do business or we, ha we have to find another way to make money, right? Let's have a real assessment of where are we? Is there anyone in the universe that wants our services that's going to pay us so that we can eat this month? Make sense? Um, Six-figure presentations, right? Are your virtual presentations buttoned up? Are your in-person presentations buttoned up? Are you practicing and mastering those? Okay. There's never been a deal without a presentation first, or at least the needs analysis. Do you know what questions to ask them? Have you practiced? Have you committed those to memory? Right? Because if somebody wants, like Candace was saying, if somebody wants to, you're on the phone with somebody and say, hey, come on over now, 30 minutes, man, you're going to spend all 30 minutes showering and getting ready to go. You don't have time to practice your presentation. That better be buttoned up. Make sense? All right, and last one is six-figure reputation. What is your reputation in the marketplace, right? Do you have a reputation for um, being late and um, yelling and having disorderly files? Or do you have a reputation for working with A-plus players, having buttoned-up contracts, being um, accessible, right? and doing the right thing by your clients. You see what I'm saying? Candace, do you know uh, agents in the marketplace that are buttoned up? And do you, also, do you also know agents in the marketplace? You don't have to name any names clearly, but do you know any agents in the marketplace that are a little, like you're not exactly excited to work with them because okay. you're gonna end up doing half of their job too? Yep. Exactly. So how are you becoming the economist of choice? Are you studying the data, right? Are you prepared when somebody says, how's business? Are you looking up how many listings went under contract every day so you can have something to talk about? What's your, what's your strategy to build your core advocate relationships, right? With vendor partners or whatnot. What is your reputation in the marketplace? And what's the evidence of that, by the way? So do you have a system for obtaining reviews, right? It's a big deal. Has anyone bought anything, let's say over like $100 without looking at a review? I don't buy anything online without looking at a review. Exactly, like a $5 spatula. You're like, oh, I wonder what people are saying about the spatula, right? You think they're not gonna look you up, right? They're gonna look up all your social media profiles. They're gonna make sure that you appear to be professional online. So as a quick sidebar, maybe you ought to do the same thing and make sure that they're not going to find anything that is objectionable. I'm not speaking to anyone directly here, but um, you want to make sure that your, your profile, on, profile online uh, demonstrates um, that you're a business person, right? Right. And finally, what are, what are your standards, right? What are the things that just you are unwilling to sacrifice on? right? Is it the number of sales you have each year? Is it the number of contacts you make it each day, right? Is it when you track, track things and when you report things? Is it who you, um, how often you speak to a mentor or something like that? Like, how do we know you're winning or how do you know you're winning? Does that make sense? Yes. One of my standards is I will not I will not show more than two homes to someone without a buyer brokerage agreement. That's a great standard. That's a great standard, 
right? I, a standard could be, I do not meet somebody, um, you know, alone in a, in a house, or I don't do a uh, open house alone, right? Or I don't show homes after night, or I don't go more than 30 miles away from my home to show property, because that's an indication that I'm probably not as strong in that marketplace, right? Like if somebody were to call me and say, hey, I'd like you to show me homes in, in uh, Decula, like, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm real good at real estate. Like I could figure out, like I'm buttoned up on pretty much everything, but I don't know anything about Tequila. I've never been there. Like not even once I've lived here my, almost my entire life. Like I, I cannot look a buyer in the face and pretend like I'm the best person to advise them in Tequila, period. So I'm not, I don't care how big the commission is. I'm not, that's an ethical issue. You see what I'm saying? So maybe that's a standard that you have in your business. And Bill, I'd like to add one thing or two things. One is um, maybe just one thing. I think the other one went out of my head. <laughs> but um, when I when I meet with lenders and when I meet with vendors uh, in different uh, services, I always make a point of saying, I'm going to give you a lot of referrals. I expect at least one from you during this year because there's no, no reason why it shouldn't be reciprocal. That's right. You know, your lender, for example, um, I mean, there were years where I gave my lender 30, 35 referrals. And I have a conversation with them and say, hey, um, according to my notes, right, uh, I've probably put somewhere around 200 grand in your pocket this year. With all due respect, I haven't got a single referral. So something's going to change. Either you're going to start supporting my business or I'm going to start supporting somebody else's. It's up to you. <laughs> right? Um, I love my car doesn't move if you are not pre-approved. <laughs> I like that one. Okay. Um, was this helpful today, guys? Definitely. All right. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. Um, by the way, last month, um, I, I see there's a couple of people that are still um, that need to report for February or some of the weeks in February. We, um, although we didn't have quite as many appointments as we did in January, we took more listings and we closed more units and we had almost double the GCI. Okay, so things are, are working. I'm real proud of you. Our conversions on listing appointments and buyer appointments is up. So congratulations on that. We took more buyer, uh, we took the same number of buyer listings with less appointments and we took more seller listings um, uh, at, a better, at a better percentage or conversion rate than we did in January. So congratulations on that. Um, thank you so much in advance, wink, wink, for reporting your numbers. And uh, today, uh, oh, just a, a quick reminder on Friday from 12 to one, we are going to be doing, uh, we're gonna welcome the uh, folks from Campbell and Brandon in to talk a little bit about the closing process um, and how the closing attorney is involved in the real estate transaction. So I hope that you'll uh, make space in your calendar for that. And um, I'm gonna be speaking to a couple of you guys about um, uh, the, the 20 minute group calls because I'm trying to shuffle some things around. So be on the lookout for a message from me. If you have any questions or any needs, please let me know. And I'm, I'm as always, very grateful uh, to be in business together. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.